Hello folks, Felix here from University Düsseldorf, Germany. In this video series, it's all about open science in the field of neuroscience and psychology. The series consists of three parts. In the first part, we have been talking about all the problems in conventional science and our motivation to engage with open science. In this video, we are going to talk about practical measures which we can take as individuals and as a community to make science open. For example, pre-registrations, using open software and non-profit journals. In the last part, we are going to address some caveats of open science and how to deal with them. Part 2. Tackling the problem. According to Wikipedia, open science is the movement to make scientific research and its dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society, amateur or professional. Note that while often mocked, Wikipedia itself is contributing to this exact cause. Open science is all about transparency and integrity. The idea is that the only cure to scientific misconduct and grey zone science is to make rigorous openness the standard in research. One main goal of open science is to restore scientific integrity, both within the scientific community as well as in outwards communication. Macintosh and Chambers identified three cornerstones of scientific integrity. First, replicability. Research is replicable when, using the same procedures and given adequate statistical power, any competent researcher is able to obtain the originally reported results of a study. Second, reproducibility. Research is reproducible when, using the published and supplemental methods, data and code, any competent researcher is able to obtain exactly the originally reported results of a study. Third, robustness. Research is robust when, using the published data, obtaining the originally reported results of the study does not overly depend on the specific analysis pipeline. Note that all of these terms are sometimes used differently in different contexts, so take their definitions with a grain of salt. More important than the terminology, however, are the specified goals of open science. So how can we practically achieve them? Let's talk about some best practices. To publish a preprint means to independently publish a manuscript before publication in a scientific journal on platforms like Archive or the Open Science Foundation preprint server. Preprints can be cited in other preprints and also published papers, and are usually searchable on Google Scholar. Publishing preprints has several advantages. First, everyone can read your manuscript. Even after journal publication, preprints can remain online and offer a way to dodge the paywall of closed access journals. Indie publications are also much faster, sometimes by several years. In modern fast-paced science, this enables up-to-date communication with peers, similar to posters at conferences. Another similarity to conference posters is that you might get valuable input from colleagues before the finalized version is published at a journal. Such crowdsourced review, however, is crucially dependent on the interest in your manuscript, which disfavors small research fields and early career researchers. In practice, you should assume that preprints are not peer-reviewed at all. Therefore, the target audience should rather be the scientific community than the public. Pre-registrations are pre-commitments to a research design or aspects thereof. Pre-registrations are typically created before data collection. They can be published on the Open Science Framework and similar platforms. An alternative is to upload pre-registrations with a timestamp but under embargo until submitted to peer review. Pre-registrations themselves are typically not peer-reviewed. Their format is usually semi-formal, ranging from a broad outline of the research plan to specific descriptions of all planned analyses. Pre-registrations potentially can reduce p-hacking and harking by distinguishing between exploratory and confirmatory analyses. A positive side effect is that they nudge researchers to think about their analysis plan before they collect data. Due to the semi-formality of pre-registrations, however, there exist no clear standards. This leaves wiggle room for interpretation and hence opportunity for abuse. Sometimes pre-registrations appear to be more about virtue signaling than proper engagement with open science. Further, it is important to point out that pre-registration does not substitute good theory, experimental design and proper statistics. A bad study is a bad study, even if you planned it that way. Somewhat a combination of preprints and pre-registrations is the register report publication format. The idea is to split the publication process in two parts. Like always, researchers have to develop an idea and design a study. 
However, before starting to collect data, they write up the introduction and methods of the plan study and submit them to peer review at a journal. The so-called stage 1 registered report manuscript is only evaluated based on the quality of the research question and the proposed methodology, but not on the results. Like any manuscript submission, the stage 1 manuscript can be accepted, rejected or subjected to further revisions. Should the manuscript pass stage 1 peer review, it receives in principle acceptance. That means the journal commits to publish the complete article upon completion of data collection, given that the authors stick to their registered methodology, which is ensured via a second round of peer review. Registered reports solve a lot of problems, like p-hacking, harking, or publication bias. Further, due to their strict formality, they cannot be as easily abused as simple pre-registrations. While not all journals have adopted the registered report publication format, support is continuously growing. As of now, over 250 different journals have adopted registered reports in some form. While implementation in some cases might still be clumsy, journals are continuously learning and improving. The Center of Open Science curates a complete list of journals which support registered reports. New research practices are most likely to be spearheaded by early career researchers. Therefore, for any scientific initiative, it is important to onboard not only faculty, but also postdocs, grad students and undergraduates. How can registered reports be beneficial to this demographic? In a career stage when publication pressure is high and resources are scarce, it is important to household. The most expensive part of science is often the data collection. Via stage 1 review and in principle acceptance, it is possible to take the publication gamble before investing. Further, stage 1 review provides you valuable feedback from experts in the field besides your supervisor and collaborators. Plus, it comes at a point where it's actually helpful, the design stage. Registered reports let you focus on quality research rather than taking as many shots as possible until stumbling upon a significant result. Lastly, registered reports can protect you from scientific misconduct imposed by superiors. We have now spent a lot of time talking about how to get confirmatory research right. But what about exploratory research? Neither pre-registration nor registered reports are fully suited nor attended for pure exploration or model development. But exploration is just as important as confirmatory research. In fact, the undervaluation of explorative research plays a big part in why researchers are often not transparent about it. As pre-registration and register reports become more widespread, however, also the perception of research articles changes, which fail to adopt these new standards. Non-pre-registered confirmatory research can hardly be distinguished from exploratory research. This also shifts incentives to be more transparent about exploration. To make science truly open, it needs not only be transparent, but also accessible. Here, the use of open software comes into play. Nowadays, there exist plenty free and sometimes even open source alternatives for most of your use cases. For example, you might consider using Zotero instead of EndNote to organize your literature. Some parts of the workflow are easier to change than others, however. For example, while few other people care where you store your references or read your papers, it will be more difficult to persuade your collaborators to switch from Microsoft Word to Google Docs or even R Markdown. A huge barrier in the adaptation of a new workflow is the necessity to learn new skills. Many might argue that data analysis in SPSS is easier than in R or Python. While I personally think that this sentiment is only partially true, there are also exist open alternatives which work very similar to SPSS. A great example is JASP. This lightweight analysis software looks and feels similar to SPSS, but is completely free and open source, thanks to maintenance by the University of Amsterdam. Noteworthy is its co-equal support of both frequentist and Bayesian analyses. Part of the change in science must happen through its culture and reception. Paradigm-driven research which carefully tests the robustness and generalizability of theories by a systematic variation of single aspects is often disregarded as incremental by old-school scholars. It is still very difficult to publish this type of research in high-impact journals. This is only one example where accuracy motives and professional motives in scientific publishing are not fully aligned. However, this focus on novelty and scientific sensations is detrimental to accurate communication and reporting. Research culture must change towards the appreciation of truth and rigor 
instead of novelty and positive results. Lastly, to address the concern of reproducibility, it is important to share both data and analysis code whenever possible. But not all forms of data sharing are equally beneficial. Highly processed data are usually less reusable than raw data. Similarly, caution must be paid to sharing code. While annotation of code is becoming increasingly common, this does not guarantee reusable or even readable code. Sharing data and code is possibly still one of the greatest weaknesses in scientific practice. For the case of code, even if it is shared, it hardly undergoes any review, error detection or unit testing, as you would expect in non-scientific software development. Code is still often seen as an ad hoc solution and a byproduct of the research process. As computational models and statistical learning arrive in the scientific mainstream, however, this negligence is no longer feasible. Starting with the education of undergraduate students, writing proper computer code should be a regular part of the curriculum just as is conducting experiments. Change cannot be left to researchers alone, as also publishers have a huge influence in academia. Ultimately, we have to make the decision what is more valuable, sensation or rigorous research. As big publishers like Elsevier continue to not make much more than lip service, other outlets arise which are fully committed to open science. Here is an excerpt from the editorial police of Calabra Psychology. The acceptance criterion for Calabra Psychology is scientific, methodological and ethical rigor. While Calabra Psychology editors and reviewers do not attempt to predict a submission's impact to the field, nor employ any topic bias in accepting articles, they will check for rigorously and transparently conducted, statistically sound, adequately powered and fairly analyzed research worthy of inclusion in the scholarly record. This is a focus on more objective acceptance criteria, and the bar is set high. Colabra Psychology supports the principles of open science, including a mandatory open data policy and an option for authors to choose open peer review. It is also noteworthy that Colabra uses a sustainable non-profit business model, which uses article processing charges only to cover costs, support open science, or pay reviewers and editors. In summary, open science best practices include publishing preprints, pre-registration and registered reports, using open software, sharing data and code, focusing on scientific rigor and not sensation, and publishing in open, non-profit journals. So far, so good. However, there are also some concerns and caveats. In the third and last video, we will deal with prominent criticisms of open science. Part 3. Caveats of open science. What are your thoughts on best practices in open science? Are they sufficient? Please let me know in the comments. At this point, I'd like to thank the great open science community on Twitter to provide me with helpful pointers and resources. Thanks for watching and see you in the last video.